All right, well, good evening to you all, uh, all those who have joined us. Uh, tonight we have a, a pandemic playbook, uh, mental wellness for student athletes. Uh, I'm your host and moderator, Claude L. Clark, the executive director of the Hampton Road Sports Commission, and we welcome you to the special program. Uh, before we begin, on behalf of the Virginia Sports Hall of Fame, CHKD Sports Medicine, and the Sports Commission, we'd like to thank our gracious sponsors, uh, Optima Health, DAVCON Inc., Atlantic Bay Mortgage, CHKD Sports Medicine, uh, and the City of Virginia Beach. Uh, good evening to you all again. Uh, thank you for joining us as we take this investigative look uh, into the mental effects of COVID-19 and uh, how that has affected our young athletes. We've had canceled games, we've had disrupted seasons, and uh, ultimate uncertainty. Uh, COVID-19 uh, pandemic has left many young athletes wondering if they'll ever play again competitively. Uh, as students athletes wrestle with so much change, maintaining their mental wellness is critical, and that's why we're here. Uh, to address these issues and challenges, we've assembled a uh, panel of esteemed professionals in this region and beyond. We have us with us tonight uh, Dr. Uh, Andrea Arcona, uh, CHKD psychologist, uh, Dr. Joel Brenner, uh, medical director of CHKD sports medicine program, Elliot France, Cox High School soccer player, uh, Chris Scott, head football coach, Oscar Smith High School, Dr. Rachel Turk, staff psychologist for the University of Richmond, uh, and Will Driscoll, executive director of the Virginia Sports Hall of Fame. If we could go back and allow Dr. Andrea Arcona to kind of kick it off and introduce herself, uh, Dr. Arcona. All right, thank you. I'm Andrea Arcona. I'm a clinical psychologist with Children's Hospital. I work in an outpatient practice in Virginia Beach and I see kids ages preschool all the way up through college age, many of whom are student athletes, even the preschoolers, student athletes, and many of whom have struggled with mental health issues, anxiety, depression, other issues throughout their lives, but many more are having significant impacts because of COVID. Many of these um, kids and adolescents and even college kids haven't experienced seven months ever not playing a sport and all the things that go along with it, the camaraderie, the um, fitness, the pushing themselves, the common goals, the team bonding, the socialization, the schedule, the <laughs> all of those things that go along with being an athlete on a team and being able to show up at school and take bus rides together and team dinners and just all of those things that they missed out on it has a, had a significant impact. I'm also the mom of, of student athletes. My daughter's older, but I have a son who's a college lacrosse player and a son who's a high school soccer player and club soccer player as well. So this is important to me on a professional level and a personal level. So I work with parents and students to help get through this um, difficult time and still uncertainty to come the best that we can. Very good. Uh, Dr. Joel Brenner, Medical Director of CHKD Sports Medicine Program. Yes, uh, thank you. And first, I'd like to thank Claudel and Will and Sam Fabian for putting this uh, important forum together and getting the word out about this for our young athletes. Um, so I, I'm a pediatric sports medicine physician trained in pediatric sports medicine and adolescent medicine. Um, as you said, a medical director for CHKD Sports Medicine Program. Also currently on the uh, Virginia High School League Sports Medicine Advisory Committee um, and team physician for Norfolk State University, Kempsville High School, along with Governor School for Performing Arts and two um, professional dance companies. Um, I oftentimes uh, over the uh, past 10, 20 years have been working on a, another epidemic of the overuse and burnout problems in sports specialization. And more recently has been focusing also on developing a mindfulness program for young athletes that we've seen a rise in, in uh, mental health issues for young athletes um, and young people in general. Good, good. Next, we have Elliot France, a soccer player from uh, Cox High School. Elliot. How's it going? Elliot France. Uh, I'm a senior this year. I've been on the uh, varsity soccer team for the last four years, and I've also played for Beach FC on the top team. Uh, we've dealt with different cancellations and seen a lot of different things firsthand from my, my peers and my teammates. So just here to give my perspective on that. Next, we have with us Coach Scott, as we said, head football coach at Oscar Smith High School in Chesapeake. 
Yes, yeah, so, uh, Chris Scott, head football coach at Oscar Smith in Chesapeake. Um, currently dealing every single day with uh, a constant audible in, in these kids' uh, lives with um, hoping to get to practice and have a day and then not have one and, and kind of being on the front lines of that disappointment when we have to be the one to kind of communicate that to parents and, um, and our athletes. And it's, uh, it's tough. It's challenging. Um, it's something that's uh, worth uh, investigating and see how we can be better at just um, being being a support, uh, a form of support for our, our athletes, um, because it is it, this this will leave a mark, as you uh, as some coaches would say. And um, I think that more discourse as such um, is progressive and allows us to do the best for for our athletes. So I appreciate you guys all coming together um, for one central focus, and that is our athletes what's for the best one. Uh, next, uh, Rachel Turk uh, with the University of Richmond. Dr. Rachel Turk. Yeah, and I agree with what everyone said, but Coach Scott just said about coming together um, to have a conversation about something really important for our student athletes. I am a clinical psychologist through the Counseling Center here at University of Richmond, um, but I'm housed within athletics. So I am solely to work with our student athlete population. Um, and doing a lot of individual therapy, uh, team sessions with them, as well as working with our coaches and staff around how do we uh, support our students in the best way we possibly can. Um, and during this really challenging time, we know mental health issues have increased in our student athletes. Um, and so making sure that we're continuing to provide them support um, and doing all that we can do to help them get through these really tough times. And finally with us, uh, Will Driscoll, Executive Director of the Virginia Sports Hall of Fame. Yeah, again, Claudel, thank you for you know, agreeing to, to host this along with us in CHKD and everybody, thank you for participating. Um, you know, mental health is, is particularly now when it comes to student athletes is, is as important as it's ever been. Uh, there are so many uncertainties out there and we really appreciate the fact that all of you are coming together to kind of talk about the resources that are available, but also how you know we as individuals can hopefully recognize and maybe react better to some of these issues that are popping up because this isn't something that anybody really has experience with. So we're kind of all in this together and I'm really happy that a forum like this can come together to, to hopefully provide a blueprint for people moving forward. So again, thank you to everybody for joining tonight. Okay. Well, now that we have our introductions, we'll get into the action. Uh, Dr. Car Arcona, we'll start with you. Uh, we had great conversation leading into this about the parents' role in all of these things. And, uh, you know, we, we see our kids struggling or we see our kids challenged. We see our kids maybe uh, exhibiting signs of things as uh, COVID has worn on. And uh, we, we've had quarantine and, and canceled seasons and postponed seasons and uncertainty about what the high school league will do or club teams will do. Uh, you know, tonight we want you to share a little bit more about uh, with us about, you know, your area study and uh, some of the coping skills uh, that parents have had to employ uh, to kind of get their kids through this time. We know it's tough and we, we want them to uh, share these, these tough moments with their kids and share these tough feelings with them and let them know it's okay to go through these tough times. But you know, how are we gonna bounce out of that and how are we one day gonna get back on the field? So if I may, what are some of the challenges that parents face uh, while working with their children to first accept the severity of the situation? Uh, thanks. Thank you. That is a fantastic question to start with. The What's been really difficult, there have been a number of things, but one of the things that's been really difficult about this is that the COVID quarantine situation has not only been, it's it bred, it breeds the symptoms of mental illness, it breeds anxiety and depression, social isolation, not being engaged in activities, gaining weight, losing weight, not sleeping, sleeping too much. You know, those are all symptoms that we ask, you know, we want parents to look out for. And the quarantine has really encouraged those symptoms. So it, it was hard for parents in the beginning, I think, to really separate what's just a normal adjustment to this and what's a bigger issue that we need to deal with. The other thing is that the quarantine interfered with all of the coping strategies that I always suggest, you know, that we suggest for people to deal with these things, get out, connect with your friends, get sunshine, get exercise, stay on a schedule, get, get your homework done, manage your time, you know, all of those things were also disrupted during this. So helping parents figure out and learn how to deal with the fact that some of these things are unavoidable, but we, we need to help our kids understand that 
it's okay to be going through it. It's okay to be sad. It's, it is a big deal to lose a spring season in high school. It is okay to be sad about the fact that you're not practicing with your friends and you don't have those team bonding experiences and you can't leave the house. You know, thankfully we have more leeway now than we did in the beginning and it's getting a little bit easier, thank goodness. But one of the first things I say to parents is to validate, make sure to not minimize the fact that it is a big deal to lose these things and that it's okay to be sad and that it's okay that it's hard to adjust and, and that we're all having a hard time. And it's okay for kids to vent and to cry and to be upset. And then once we've done that, we need to not let them get stuck in that space. We need to be able, we can't skip that space, but we don't wanna get stuck there either. So then we have to move into, okay, how do we fill in what we don't have? So if even now, you know, our kids who are able to do club sports are lucky because a lot of those are still going, but kids who only participate in school sports are still, most of them are still not able to be with their teams. So I suggest to, to parents all along that we try to A, have a schedule, for kids because that's one of the biggest things that kids need that they didn't have um, and adolescents as well this is this is you know advice for adolescents as well who are able to take care of some of these things on their own have a schedule manage the sleep manage the exercise manage the food you know the eating keep all of that as healthy as possible but also the things that kids missed most are have a training schedule. And it's a little bit too much to ask, I think for most kids, even adolescents to come up with their own drills and workout routine and all of that. But most coaches, and I, I, I bet um, coach Scott would be willing to, uh, to support this, if a kid reaches out, you reach out to your coaches, ask them for a set of drills, ask them for a, a workout schedule, ask them for team goals that the whole team can work on and report back on. And how many pushups did we get through? Who dropped, who got a personal best on a mile? You know, those kinds of things that encourage people to still feel part of a team, even if they're have to do, having to do it all alone. Um, whenever they safely can, I encourage parents to encourage kids and encourage adolescents to get together with your team, do pickup games, go to the beach, go to a state park, go to your school, don't go to your school because you're not supposed to, but whatever, find a place outside where you can be together safely and socially distant and still have little groups that are part of a team. So there's that kind of bonding. Um, and also to be able to um, have the, if, if you can only do virtual, because some in the beginning that was all it was, um, connect with your friends virtually. Do activities that are team related or group related that allow you to have that social network as much as you can. Um, and when you can be together, we're so fortunate that we have the beach, we have the state parks, we have great weather for the most part, that kids can be outside. As long as parents and families are comfortable, get your kids together and help them get connected. Encourage them to be doing the things that approximate what they're missing. Valuable. Uh, Coach Scott down there, did you uh, wanna uh, add to that? And then we're coming to you next. Yes, um, I think that, you know, those are all the things that we can do. Um, you know, just as a coach, I, I'll have to say that, you know, I was somewhat shocked and kind of didn't know what play to call in telling some of our parents what exactly they could do or couldn't do. Because, again, you know, my responsibility lies within staying within the guidelines of the VHSL provides and allows us and then obviously within our local school systems and you know this just adds to a little bit of the shock and awe in regards to I didn't I didn't know what I could almost ask of my students you know um just there in the last response we kind of hear of you know still stay in those groups but if you're not allowed to go to the school then don't do it at the school go somewhere else and some of those things are that like the questions that parents and coaches had at first at the beginning of this, um, which led to some voids, you know, um, but I think at the end of the day, all of those things are the best course of action. You know, I think we got to find, you know, this is the coach in me. You got to find the, the, uh, the good out of things, um, the positive aspect of it. And, you know, a lot of this does promote some self-discipline that we ask, you know, they, not that they have to do it on their own, because just as we're, we're meeting and talking via Zoom, right? Um, we, there's some things that we, we were able to do as a team, but then promote some of the self-discipline and then praise that, you know, come up with some sort of system um, that allows the, the, the parent and the coach and, and assistant coaches to work together to kind of give those data boys to the uh, players and to the athletes when they're doing some extra stuff um, that maybe seems like outside of practice because we've always asked for that go that little you know 
the difference between ordinary and extraordinary is extra, right? So they're doing the extra stuff. So, um, but all of those are great in line, and and you know those are all tools that I that I'm definitely taking notes on and and ready to use. Good, good, Coach Scott. We appreciate you running with that. A uh, brief reintroduction of sorts. That was Coach Scott from Oscar Smith, and uh, you know certainly a uh, powerhouse program there in Chesapeake. Uh, you know, long, long history of a great football, but obviously been very much affected by the VHSL guidelines, CDC guidelines, uh, postponement of seasons, practice restrictions, all sorts of things. So coach, if, if we could ask, you know, how have you had to change your overall uh, daily routine with yourself and your staff to run a program uh, based on this, uh, based on this COVID pandemic? You've touched on some of it, but if you directly address that for us, we'd appreciate it. Yeah, I think that, um, you know, What's required um, in order to run uh, a, a very strong traditional program is it, it comes down to time. And so um, time management, how we spend time together. So it, the difference became not in our time, but how we were going to be able to do that in the time that was needed um, or that is needed. And so um, through Zoom meetings, through our assistant coaches having some chats, um, through our assistant coaches doing some drill work and film work with our guys just to stay engaged and maybe the overall purpose was you know we didn't know when exactly we would be able to get back on the field but it's just having that interaction that's what sports give us um you know it's a lot of feel a lot of parents and a lot of players feel like things have been taken away from them and and rightly so so you know um it sounds tough when it's worded that way but at the end of the day um you know what can you still give um, as a coach and as as a player and that's what we had to do we had to work on that so again we did it through zoom meetings I tell you what was really neat is that um, I had more interaction with coaches around the state uh, I think you know we all should have probably if we could have known about a little bit of this we could have invested in 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 zoom a little bit knowing how important that would have been to all of us but uh so I, it allowed us to build relationships I think professionally as coaches and then we were able to to ask, how is your community handling this? What are some questions your parents are getting? I mean, we were we were on a panel talking from coaches all the way from obviously uh, the Hampton Roads area all the way out to Bristol, Tennessee, and um, and so we took that model and we started doing it with our players, and we started to meet and talk with them and give them some of the drills, just as the, um, just as Doctor referred to earlier, um, giving them some things to work on, give them a little bit. In, in regards to concentrating. Uh, from there, we're able to do a little bit of Zoom workouts. Uh, you know, me going back, putting on my parent hat for a second, right? My daughter is a freshman at Ocean Lakes High School. And, um, you know, she had optional workouts, which I reinforced with her were optional, right? That, that was the coach in me. But she had optional workouts with, um, with, her, with her volleyball team. And, um, you know, just embracing that um, difference and trying to do it with a positive light. Th those were the ways that we did it. And um, we grew from it. We saw the good in the, I wouldn't say the good and the bad, but we found out how to work it. Um, we went through our um, growing pains, but all in all, you know, it's allowed us to get to the point to where we're able to spend two days a week with our young men. Um, I think having them uh, kind of be the first bit of athletes to learn how to be leaders and follow the guidelines is something that we embraced with our guys said, listen, you know, we're, we're not sure when we'll get back, but we need to adhere to the guidelines set forth by the VHSL. Make sure you wear the mask so that when we do get inside the building, this is the social norm for us right now so that we can protect every moment that we can when we get hands on. Um, we did different things to where we, we there were no, um, when we were able to get back with them, there's no just stand in line. Like we had to formulate our line with cones, just as you see at some of the local grocery stores. Like we had to come up with areas of where you're going to stretch and where your workout area is. And when you're standing in line and you're communicating with the next person in, uh, in line about maybe a technique or about maybe you dropped the ball and you had to keep your hands, uh, your hands and eyes, hands together, eyes on the ball, you know, we had to go through, listen guys, you can talk, but we can't be on top of each other. We ended up doing a, a breakdown where um, instead of bringing it in tight and everybody get their hand in the middle, you know, we all get our hands up and we're breaking down from, you know, in a 50 yard radius. But um, we just found a way to, to overcome and adhere to the guidelines, but yet still be positive, still be progressive and still working for that overall goal. Um, and our guys have, our guys' persistence and perseverance 
through that, I think was probably uh, more impactful on the coaches than us coaches on the young, young men. So um, those are some of the ways that we've responded thus far. A valuable insight coach and a <laughs> positive spin on, on so much uh, adversity and so many challenges and so much uh, uncertainty. Uh, you you kind of covered all of our questions in, in one response. So <laughs> great, great response there. And really touched on some of the topics that we talked about. We were going to touch on mindfulness and we're, we're touching on coping skills and you've had to do those things. Uh, it it kind of segues perfectly into our, our next guest or panelist, uh, Elliot from uh, Cox, uh, if, if you're with us there. Uh, we wanted you to give us a snapshot uh, at your age group and at your age level on, on what it's like to be a, a Cox High School student. A student athlete, student first, and a member of the soccer team. And what challenges have you had? And what scheduling delays and scheduling uncertainty have you had? And uh, what is your team doing to uh, stay connected? And how are you all moving forward to hopefully a spring season? Yeah. So going off of what uh, what Coach Scott said, I honestly wish that our team was doing more to to do so because right now it is a complete uncertainty for us because we have a, a spring season. So my last game that I played was for Beach FC was the state cup finals. And then for Cox, it was my second scrimmage. And that was it. That was the last time that I was able to get on the field. So for a lot of guys who don't play club, they weren't able to get back on the field after. And like we lost complete connection with our Cox team because it was so new and we didn't really know like what to do during COVID that we didn't do the things to stay connected. We didn't do the things that we normally do such as team dinners. So I feel as though we lost chemistry in that time that we would have, especially with the younger group that we had at Cox high school for the later years. And I know now that club season's back on, and they had to have a delayed start, but they're playing games now and they're practicing. But our approach for our Cox team is that they're pretty hands off during this time because a lot of our players are playing club. So we're not getting a lot of interaction with each other because everyone plays for different teams right now. Well, with that said, it sounds as if you've had to take an individual approach to some degree. You know, what are you currently doing to maintain your uh, physical readiness and, and your uh, improvement really in an off season, getting ready for the spring? Yeah, so for right now, since I'm not playing club, I'm, I try to have a, a workout schedule. I, I do scheduled workouts on Fridays and Saturday. And then during my lunches, which we have an hour period between our Zooms, I try to go on runs as often as possible just to stay in shape. Because for me, I'm losing a lot of my my technical because I'm not on the ball constantly because I lost a whole season of working out five days a week being on the ball having games and then this whole club season once again training three days a week having games each weekend to going to nothing so I'm trying to stay in shape as much as possible and just try to have that schedule but it's, it's hard to keep yourself doing that with school and with everything else going on. So uh, would you say that, you know, you've been able to reach out to club coaches or the high school coaches or your assistants, you know, who, who has helped you with these workout programs or have you just simply generated these things on your own? Yeah, I personally haven't, haven't reached out to our coaches. I, I, uh, I like the insight on that. I think that would be a great way for kids to be able to get back into their like normal schedule. Uh, I've been generating them myself and just trying to use the free time that I have to keep doing that so that I am able to play next season. But I think that'd be a great way to do it if, if, uh, if they're willing. And our coaches, my, uh, my high school coach especially has been really helpful in reaching out and saying, hey, like I need, especially the seniors because we do have the option to graduate early this year they've he's been reaching out telling us like hey you guys need to make sure that you're eligible for next season saying that you need three classes he's been willing to talk to us about anything he's reached out multiple times just saying if you guys need anything I'm here for you and do this and that and it's helped me because I actually only had two classes so I wasn't going to be eligible for next 
uh, semester to play and now I am. So it's, it's been helpful for him reaching out and I'm, I'm sure other kids have been in contact with him, just being there, being able to talk to him for anything. Well, good, good. Uh, yeah, thank you for that insight, uh, Elliot. Uh, next we have Dr. Turk at the University of Richmond, the Spiders. And uh, Dr. Turk's been there about a year or a little bit more and uh, works with their sports psychology there in the athletic department. And as many of you all know, uh, you see programs and, and budgets being adjusted and cut, uh, student athletes uh, being uh, widely affected from these changes. And uh, we can only imagine the types of um, concerns and issues that she sees uh, come across her desk and her team's desk, and then strategies they have to employ uh, to combat those things. So uh, Dr. Turk, if you would give us a little bit more about you know, what you're doing there to uh, overall or strategically combat this, and we had some other questions for you after that. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I think, you know, just like Dr. Arcona said earlier, there's a wide variety of responses to everything that was happened. And um, when everything first happened and our students were sent home at spring break or their spring break was extended and then they were sent home, um, seasons were cut very quickly, as everyone knows. And so our first mindset was how do we prepare to support these students through losing a season? How do we, before we knew they would get eligibility back, how do we know, you know, what's going to happen with our seniors? Um, what's going to happen to this incoming freshman class who now are being sent home from school, aren't getting to finish their senior seasons. Um, so we uh, had to shift from that then into now we're heading into a fall semester where um, originally sports were sort of postponed and then, you know, our conference um, said that they were not participating and all fall sports were going to be um, pushed back until the spring. Um, and still decisions are being made about our winter sports now. And so things have shifted pretty dramatically. Uh, we knew that there was going to be a pretty heavy increase in mental health concerns. Um, I've seen a huge increase in student athletes coming in for individual therapy to, to talk about the anxiety or the stress that they're feeling. Fortunately, we are not one of the schools that has had um, any programs cut yet. Um, but as always, there's you know, budget, budget cuts and roster sizes and um, other stressors that we still do have to be worried about. And so we have, you know, student athletes who, um, whereas they are getting to practice now, our sports medicine and strength and conditioning have done a wonderful job integrating them back in, they aren't getting to compete. Um, so they aren't getting that outlet of the, you know, most enjoyable part about their sport. They don't get to do that. They don't get the social time that they were expecting. And then they also transition back from spending um, months at home at home with family, um, which, you know, we know is not necessarily a great place for everyone, but for a lot of our student athletes, it is um, spending all that time at home then to getting back and having very strict guidelines about, you know, not leaving campus, not being able to travel, not being able to go home, um, all for safety purposes, going through a lot of testing um, to make sure that they can practice and compete. Um, so really, we decided to put in place a whole mental health plan for the semester. Um, every team went through a mental health 101 sort of training. So we talked to them about the increase that COVID is likely to cause in mental health concerns. Um, and then a little bit about what mental health symptoms, signs and symptoms to be aware of, um, how to get, how to help a friend or help themselves if they see something like that coming up. Um, and then how to get connected to resources and what types of things they have available to them. So we did that with every team, all of our coaching staffs, our sports medicine staff, just to make sure that everyone was aware of this. Um, and we also did mental health screeners coming in with every one of our student athletes. Um, and so that was something that gave me personally the chance to touch base with um, practically every one of them, uh, which was, you know, wonderful to get to see them all the one time I got to see them all in person actually. Um, and get to see them all, check in on how they're doing, check in on how they were throughout quarantine, and then get them connected um, for therapy or other services if they needed them. Well, good. With that strategic plan, I, I know we had um, talked leading into this. You know, can you tell us a little bit more about what the NCAA has found uh, as it relates to uh, COVID-related effects? Yes. Um, so NCAA did a study um, in April and May of this year that was Basically, I mean, they looked at a lot of different things, but a big portion of it was the impact of COVID on mental health in our student athletes. Um, and there's a lot of really interesting information within that report, but the biggest thing that I took away from it and why we created this mental health plan was 
um, they were already in April and May of this year seeing a 150 to 250% increase in mental health symptoms in our student athletes. Um, and I mean, for someone in, in my type of position, um, it's not shocking knowing everything that's going on, everything that people are facing, but it's also scary um, that that many of our student athletes we know are gonna be struggling that much. Um, and so we wanted to try to be as proactive as possible while also knowing this is reacting to COVID and everything that comes along with it. And um, we have with us uh, Dr. Brenner uh, with CHKD Sports Psychology. And, um, you know, during this time, one would think uh, in COVID and canceled seasons or postponed seasons, it's automatically a, a break period or a rest period uh, or a time to not have so many throws on the arm or uh, swings of the bat. Uh, but doctor, if you could share with us, uh, what, what kind of trends and what kind of symptoms are you seeing? Are our, our student athletes at this time getting the rest that we think? Uh, or are you actually seeing overuse injuries and, and a different trend? Yeah, so as I mentioned previously, you know, we've been battling the overuse and burnout and sports specialization epidemic over the past decade. And so initially we thought when COVID broke out and everything shut down that this would almost cure that problem because everyone was forced to rest. Um, and initially people were resting because everything was shut down so tightly. Um, but pretty quickly after, um, you know, just a couple months, two, three months when things started to open up a little bit, um, then all the clubs and travel teams uh, started to participate um, without much real conditioning or gradual ramp up. Um, a lot of people were going from doing no training, no conditioning to playing weekend tournaments um, in, in all the sports. And so what we've seen now is more um, acute overuse problems, uh, little league shoulder, little league elbow. We've seen more ACL tears uh, from kids who are out there participating in their sports. Um, you know, in, in football, they're doing seven on seven, so they're not doing um, tackle and stuff, but we're seeing a lot of non-contact injuries like ACL tears too. Um, so that, that's been a little bit of a problem with that. The other thing that we've seen is that with high school sports being shut down besides um, out of season practice that's been allowed, um, and as Elliot said, a lot of people are doing their club sports, their travel sports, but there's a lot of kids who can't afford uh, to participate in travel teams. Um, and so there's actually more, I, I think it's increased the disparity between kids who can play and who can't play um, because school sports, you know, when they're open, they're available to everybody, no matter what your income level is. And so that's really, I think, um, can affect a, a segment of our population. And with them not being able to play for a significant period of time at this month, you know, time seven months, that definitely can increase the mental health issues too. Sure, certainly. So as, as we talked, you know, at a time like this, when we feel like with uh, numbers of uh, COVID cases under control and uh, you know, the sports slated to possibly start back at the beginning of the year, uh, what kind of a uh, mental frame of mind do you feel like the athletes that you're seeing are in? I mean, do you feel like they're, they're certainly ready now and, and this is a positive boost or do we feel like we're certainly in a, uh, kind of a mid COVID still mentality. Uh, where are we at mentally uh, with the athletes that you're seeing? Um, well, I think, you know, the, I think right now everyone's really chomping at the bit uh, to get back to sports. The parents, the coaches, the athletes, um, the providers, you know, I, I'm used to for the past 20 years, I've been on the sidelines of a football game every Friday and Saturday. And so this is the first time when I, when I haven't. Um, and so I think everyone's really excited about it, but there's also the unknown, um, you know, the, the current um, thought and the current plan for the public schools is that things will start up winter sports middle of December, but that's only if the metrics and, and the, um, the incident rate of COVID does not get worse. So that's always subject to change too. Um, but I, I, I think you know, everyone's really excited to hopefully get um, school sports back and get more people on the field safely. Something else that you've, uh, we've discussed and you've been very um, versed on mindfulness uh, at a time like this, maintaining physical well-being, 
uh, leading into uh, maintaining discipline, leading into a, a sports season, uh, maybe a wrestler or a football player or any sports athlete trying to maintain muscle structure or weights or different things of that nature. Uh, tell us a little bit more about mindfulness and how athlete at this time, a student athlete at this time should be using that and uh, go into that uh, for a little bit more uh, detail for us. Sure. So just to define what mindfulness is, it, it's we hear about it a lot, especially over the past five or years or so in the late press. But um, a simple definition is just paying attention to the present moment on purpose. Um, and so it's been used in athletes for ages. It's been used for people for thousands of years. Um, it, it doesn't necessarily have any religious uh, affiliation for it. Um, but it can be used for, for a variety of things. So we can be mindful about our exercise plan. We can be mindful about eating. Um, so a, a simple example in terms of nutrition and eating that I talk about with my families coming in for any problem. Um, you know, oftentimes people will be having dinner in front of the TV and they won't really be mindful about what they're eating. Um, and they're just watching the TV and before you know it, their plate is gone. So instead, a, a more mindful way would be to sitting down at the table as a family, TV off, phones away in another room and having a more mindful discussion and, and talk about life, talk about their feelings, talk about how great the food is, um, how great the weather is here. So we could be mindful that way. Um, but mindfulness is, it can be used right now for a lot of things such as helping with stress, helping with anxiety, helping with focus, um, and even in pre-COVID times, um, it can be helped in athletes with performance. So we've seen a lot of uh, professional athletes just over the past couple of years come out that they are really pushing and promoting mindfulness. LeBron has over the past year come out with this. There's a lot of the local professional athletes um, who I've talked with who have used mindfulness throughout their career. Uh, Michael Kadire is one of the local uh, baseball players. He spoke at our first uh, forum back at ODU as COVID was breaking out. He's used mindfulness to help with a successful career. So I think um, young athletes, older athletes, everyone can use mindfulness to help them perform better. And, and this is something that they can work on now when they might not be able to be on the field as much, um, but they can really train their brain um, to perform better too. Well, Dr. Turk, if we could um, bring it back to you uh, as we were talking uh, in terms of mindfulness, obviously the mindfulness needed and the performing in the moment needed uh, goes up as you go up in levels. So on the college level, you know, has, has that touched your office or are you working with other sports psychologists there uh, who, are, who are working with mindfulness or working in that space with your student athletes? Oh, absolutely. And, uh, you know, I do think the younger you can learn it and the more you can start applying it early, the better off you are. And, and for sport performance related stuff and for mental health. I mean, the number of my student athletes that have trouble sleeping at night, um, and we talk about different ways to use mindfulness and deep breathing and relaxation to help promote uh, more positive sleep is, um, it's a lot of folks. Uh, so yes, we do a lot of those conversations, um, again, breaking it down on sort of a very simple level for them um, about how that applies and how they can use that in the moment um, to both help performance, but help them function on a day-to-day -day basis as a student athlete, as an individual within their personal life. Coach oh, Scott, um, uh, to you, I, I would imagine uh, every position on the field, uh, every, every defense, offense, special teams, you know, has to work in that space. You know, your, your thoughts on that, sir? Um, in regards to, as you, on the mindfulness, is that yes, what you're referring to? Yeah, I think that, um, you know, I guess we would call that focus and making sure that we're focused in on what task, task it is. You know, um, for us, I've asked my coaches to make sure that we're mindful of the stress that we're, we are putting on our students' bodies. And typically where we would be in the, in the, lifting pyramid and scheme of things so I, I was I had a really good opportunity to sit down with the University of North Carolina and their strength conditioning coach and um, you know those some of those uh, college studies have been you know they were worried about some of the um, the injuries that happened with some of the NFL players years ago uh, on on their abbreviated season and so they were in hopes of preparing for stuff um, as such 
shortened seasons, not being able to get enough conditioning in, um, started to develop a little bit of a mindful plan so that we, when we came back, we didn't just automatically start shocking our guys to, you know, squats and deadlifts and hang cleans and some high performing exercises or getting them out there to run routes and, you know, um, cutting hard. So we, we, we try to use a progressional way and be mindful of that and concentrate on each step. We kind of, I don't know why, but my coach called it the bird dog step, right? So I still call it that, but it's the first step in the direction that we're going and trying to make sure that, you know, our knees and our shoulders are over and um, over each other and we're not opened up uh, our gate and just trying to be mindful and teach where it looks like we're slowing down and more, but we're being more specific. And I think that made us better coaches and it made the young men better players because just as, um, as we heard earlier with that, these are techniques used by some of the highest athletes at their game right now. Right. And some of the strongest performing um, to have them slow down. I mean, I think our guys want to come back in there and they're like, coach, we're ready for the burnout. We call it a cookout. You know, we go through 60 different types of exercises and this, that, and the other. And, and it's more of a uh, hurrah type of event. And it's like, whoa, whoa, whoa. no, I, I mean, I, I'm definitely ready to work towards that moment, but we're not there. And I think we've had to be mindful of the actions because of some of the injuries, just as um, doctor was referring to in regards to some of the ACL injuries and non-contact injuries, you know, that those are the things that you're worried about. Had an elite defensive lineman, you know, that showed up, uh, he was hit hard. Um, you know, he had uh, his family was hit hard with this event. And those big guys have to stay active and move around. And then all of a sudden you saw a guy that played running back as in middle school. That was a 265, 275 pound guy that was one of the strongest guys I've ever had a chance to coach. And then he's now all of a sudden at 305, 310, you know, and, and has excess weight on because of that so being mindful of those things and saying listen we're not going to get right back into those exercises we need to kind of um recondition ourselves and take our time crawl before we walk um that's what we've been mindful of and then you know the guys have bought in for the most part you can sense a little bit at the beginning that coach like we would be so much further advanced than this right now and their anticipation and and eagerness to try to want to jump forward to what we would be would have been or where we would have been you know trying to reprogram them mentally and that's what that technique of being mindful is all about so it's it's the way that we have to coach right now um because when we're not around them as much we have to be mindful of those things and try to dictate as much as we can through our instruction certainly, certainly. well we have with us um will driscoll the executive director of the virginia sports hall of fame and he certainly um, gets to interact with athletes at the highest level, uh, Hall of Famers from uh, all sports uh, here from Virginia and beyond. And so he certainly has a different uh, perspective on these things and uh, had a number of uh, great questions uh, that we discussed that he wanted to throw at the panel. So, Will. Yeah, thank you, Claudel. I've, uh, I've really enjoyed listening. And, and that's one of my favorite parts about these types of events is listening and learning. Um, and, and I guess the first question it will kind of go to the doctors, and I'm not going to pick one because I think you all could probably offer some insight into this, but um, as you all probably know, the University of Wisconsin School of Medicine and Public Health did a study during COVID where they surveyed over 3,200 high school age student athletes, 68% uh, responded saying they are experiencing some level of anxiety and depression that would typically require some level of treatment. Um, that's up 37% from past studies. There, there are two questions in this. Um, one, is that number alarming, expected, both? And two, how important is it for us to understand how to react to this now, knowing that this pandemic and this situation we're in currently will end in its current form, but these symptoms may not be on that same schedule. How important is it to understand exactly what we're dealing with in this moment moving forward? So, um... Yeah, I'll just touch on it first. I, I think um, the study, it was a good study done by some of my colleagues out in Wisconsin and not as alarming, um, concerning, um, but I think even before COVID, there was uh, a lot of, there were mental health issues in young athletes that we just didn't pay as much attention to. So I think one of the, the silver linings is that it is bringing a focus to the mental health aspect of young people and young athletes. Um, so, um, I think in terms of, uh, the second part, um, 
I think we need to really put into play different treatment plans of how to help the young athletes, because you're right. Um, hopefully they're, they're back on the fields and, and we get COVID under uh, control um, sooner than later, uh, but they're still gonna need help with this because it's gonna continue. And I think that's where using the resources, using the tools, using you know, our, our psychologists, using our psychiatrists, using your physicians, the coaches, the parents, it really has to be a team approach. Um, so whether it's talk therapy, medication, mindfulness, um, and, and just reestablishing that social connection, because I think that's going to be the most important part. I would add to that kind of tying together a lot of what you said, along with the mindfulness, that one of the real benefits of mindfulness, from my perspective, is helping people, helping students and student athletes to focus on what they can control versus what they can't. And we've all, even us adults, <laughs> have had a shock to our system about the things that we never expected to not be able to control, like going to school and going to work and being able to have a, a season. So helping the student athletes really focus on, okay, I can, I can keep myself in shape. I can keep myself ready. Even if school sports don't happen, which we never would have even entertained the thought of last year, I can still be ready. And that's still going to be to my benefit, whether we have the season or not, it's still going to be good for me um, because I, it will pay off at some point. So focusing on those things. And I also, I agree with you that or agree with the point that just because COVID ends, this isn't, things are going to get a lot better, I think, for athletes, because all of those things, all of those coping strategies, all of those bonding opportunities, and all of those things are going to be back, so it's going to help, but this sense of life can change dramatically, and I can lose the, some of the most important things to me um, outside of the people that I love, the connections to them, the connection to my sport, the connection to my school, even being able to be where I want to be or where I belong um, is, is that's, that's hard for kids and that's not going to go away. So being able to be prepared, like Dr. Brenner was saying, how to connect people, how parents can recognize how to connect and where to connect through school counselors, pediatrician, um, mental health professionals like myself and like Dr. Turk and just being able to find that access point through coaches, through parents to get um, people the help that they need if the adjustment doesn't come as quickly as we might like it to when things get back to normal, if things ever get back to normal. And I absolutely echo all of that. I actually was on a webinar um, not too long ago, and one of the points that they made was they felt like um, once COVID, once we do get through this main wave of the physical impact of COVID, the second, the second wave really is the mental health impact. Um, and these symptoms don't just disappear. They don't just go away. Yes, we get some coping skills back, and that will absolutely help things. Um, but there's still going to be a lot of loss to process. There's going to be a lot of things to get through. Um, and so I, I would echo, you know, what everyone is saying and the connection to resources is big and the teaching these skills and how to manage these things on their own um, is incredibly important. Um, in addition to the validation of this is real and you're not weak for asking for help. And I think in student athletes, that stigma is so high already for seeking help with mental health issues um, that right now, I mean, I have student athletes coming to me that's like, I don't even know why I'm why I'm feeling this way, why I'm going through what I'm going through. It should, it's not really that bad. Um, and so they can't even process why they're having such a hard time with it. And so just being there to validate that this is a, a world pandemic that we're going through and no one expected this and no one has a playbook for how we handle it. Um, and it's okay to get the help that you need. hundred percent. And I think a lot of people need to understand that it is okay. It's okay to talk about it. That's why we had the event in March with Dr. Brenner and Michael Kadire. That's why we're having this event um, Elliot, my next question is actually for you. Uh, are, are you and your teammates or your or other peers, other student athletes and other sports kind of talking about what's going on right now? Um, are you seeing any of them that may have been on the athletic scholarship track, maybe now putting more pressure on themselves because they don't have that season to get the, the extra recruiting video? Um, are, are you guys sharing information or just kind of helping each other, you know, through this process? Yeah. So, uh, I, a lot of us are talking to each other, like trying to stay in touch and just see like where everyone is. Um, a lot of my guys are still getting chances to be seen because of the way uh, the soccer community works is that a lot of our um, recruiting opportunities come from our club teams and not from our uh, school teams, but for sure getting those clips in is a big deal. 
Um, for my team, especially, we were supposed to go to the regionals, which was a huge tournament. And I know that that one, along with a lot of others, were canceled. And those are huge scouting opportunities. So for a lot of people, it was just a loss of opportunity of just like being able to get out there and being seen. So uh, some are still being recognized through their club, but it uh, is definitely taking a drawback on, on the scouting opportunities. Coach Scott, uh, you mentioned that you had kind of been doing a shared experience exercise where some of your players and coaches were talking to other players and coaches from across the state, kind of going through this together. Um, how has that kind of helped you, your players, your coaching staff with morale going through this whole pandemic? I think uh, it's helped us a lot. And just in regards to maintaining those relationships and strengthening them, I think that all the doctors pointed out that, um, you know, this situation has has forced us to coach differently. It's uh, it's forced us to find a way to concentrate on the mental things and the mental health issues. Um, it's allowed us to take time. I mean, we've we we have a leadership board, and we te and each each week we would have a, a topic that we would bring up, and a lot of times that was either pointed out by a senior that something they noticed and they wanted to address with the team, and and then we had with our word of the day. Um, but we took those concepts and there's a lot of things that have gone on socially since this as well. The social impact of COVID, all of the social issues surrounding our country and taking the time to have talks about that, um, that where we're not on the field, but we're still coaching each other on how to deal and how to be open-minded and how to be socially accepting. I mean, that's, and I'm getting Coach Hills listening, are saying, talking about what we did because there were some very powerful moments there where the connections were strengthened because we we had more time to sit down and, and, and concentrate on some things that were some really deep, deep doctors tissue issues, right? Uh, with our with our with our players and athletes, and it just allowed us to to strengthen those bonds. Um, and we found out stuff about players that we, we didn't know. We found, found out that they cared or they were expressing themselves in a different way when, when maybe we thought they were, just weren't into it. So those things were powerful. Um, it's forced us to be uncomfortable, but then find a way to, you know, um, to be comfortable in, in, in amidst the, the um, struggle, I guess, or the challenge. So those are some ways that we did. I, I really think that some of those issues, those social issues, and some of the things that we talked about just really brought a lot to light, and it helped strengthen the bonds. That's, a, that's wonderful. And, and again, talking it out, you know, that's why we did the program, as I mentioned in March, that's why we're doing this. And I think Dr. Spencer from CHKD said, it has to start with a conversation. You can't have the conversation unless somebody starts talking about it. And so my final question before I give it back to Claudel is actually back to you, Elliot. Um, do you see something like this becoming more prevalent in high school among student athletes and among resources, just kind of sharing information among your peers? Is it something that you guys currently do or is that something that you could see maybe forming as a result of the pandemic? Uh, I would definitely say that there, there is that relationship between teammates where it does kind of turn into like a brotherhood or a sisterhood, depending. And it is a place where you can outlet a lot of your emotions that you can't usually, whether that's to your teammates or just in the sport itself, just physical activity, just getting that like brute work out there. But uh, I, I think that it's not a conversation that within high schools, especially we have enough. There has been like, especially in my community, there's been like instances of suicide where it has been our past athletes and they've either just lost that, that, um, that outlet of sport or they've lost the team aspect of being able to talk to someone and have those people surrounding you for that like period of time. So it's definitely a conversation that needs to be continued to grow within the high school communities. And I, I think that it's there, but there's definitely progress that can be made on it. 100%. There's always progress to be made. And then hopefully we're doing a little part tonight in helping make some of that progress. So I, I thank everybody for participating. Claudel, I'm going to hand it back to you. Will, uh, great questions and uh, more insight uncovered. Um, a little bit of uh, time for Q&A uh, before we have to kind of land this thing. 
But um, uh, Chris from uh, all the way from uh, um, Hawaii ask, and uh, we can chime in as need be. Ask you know if if, if a school system or a uh, governing body knows that a program or, or a sports season possibly may be canceled, should they go ahead and cancel it or should they leave it open for a possibility to occur? And, uh, you know, what is you all's take on that as a, as a panel? I can, I can start with that one. I would, I would say that uh, uh, I was definitely excited for my season last year. Mm -hmm. And at first, they said that it was going to be two weeks that we were going to be out of school and then our season would resume. And then that turned into a longer and longer period of time. And they gave us a little bit of hope, but then at the end they said, there's no season, there's no rest of the school year even. So it was very blunt in how it happened. And it, it did like affect us a little more harshly than I think it would have if they had told us up front. But with this season, uh, how they're going about it, I think it's a little better. They're saying that they're, they're giving us a plan. They're giving us dates that are there, but they're also saying, keep in the back of your mind that this is not certain. There are things that need to happen for your season to happen. So this is an if right now. So they're not giving us a direct answer, but they're at least giving us a little bit to go off of that we can feel that we could have a season. It's a possibility at least, which I feel helps a little bit. And come the time that our season rolls around, if we don't have it, it's going to be a disappointment, but at least we'll be, we'll be one step closer for the next year or know how to deal with it better in the future. So more from our Q and A, um, we, we've talked about uh, coping skills. We talked about symptoms. We talked about challenges. We talked about uh, staying positive and, and doing different things. Uh, but our, our parent asks, uh, where does one start for a high school or a college uh, student athlete? Where does one start to get help about these things if you notice these symptoms? Um, I'm, I'm happy to start with that one. I think the, the first place to start is by talking to your, to, to your child and doing your best to do some of those things like validating and helping them get their feelings out and helping them um, take some steps to make changes in their lives that will help them feel more in control, feel more scheduled, feel more connected in those things. So to start that no matter what, because that's gonna be helpful and that's gonna be part of the, of the treatment no matter where they land. But then also in our community, we do have a lot of support. So starting either with the pediatrician who can help connect you to a mental health professional, um, a coach or a school counselor um, or a teacher or a pastor, any trusted person in the community who can who has connections to get you um, to a mental health professional. Again, the, in our community, the best places to start really are with your pediatrician, with a mental health specialist if you already know how to get connected, and or somebody at the school who can help you get connected to a higher level of help to support you through it. And I'll just add to that, um, there's, you know, you can also, for anyone who has insurance, you can contact your insurance provider and they're able to provide you with a list of approved um, mental health providers in your area. So that's one avenue you can take. Um, there's lots of different search engines that you can sort of look up um, different mental health providers in your area. There's also a lot of wonderful resources online right now. And I think that's something that COVID has really um, sort of beefed up during that time. Um, so there's a lot of podcasts. There's a lot of podcasts specific to student athletes. Um, so Holinsky's Hope is one um, that I know is aimed more at collegiate athletes, um, but is specific to mental health and student athletes. Um, there's, you know, there's a whole list of them that I'm, I, I'm sure we can probably post somewhere, but if you just start honestly Google searching it, um, you will probably find a whole host of things. There's tons of podcasts out right now. There's a lot of different um, videos from different programs. A lot of universities have put stuff out. Um, so there's a lot of different ways to start, um, I guess, dipping your toe into the water of this area if it's something that you're thinking, or even if you're not really, cons not really sure what you need to be looking for uh, in your student athlete, um, there's obviously a lot of information out there about that as well. 
And I'd also just, just to add, um, you know, if anyone's interested in just learning more about mindfulness too, um, there's different apps out there that um, you can look at in the comfort of your own home, um, a variety of them. Um, and then also, you know, at, at CHKD, like uh, Dr. Arcona said, you know, we've got a whole mental health network there, uh, whether it's psychologists, psychiatrists, our mindful program, a variety of things. So I, I think the most important thing is for parents, as we've heard throughout the night, is for everyone to just ask. Um, that's a big thing. So for, you know, parents, for athletes, for coaches to ask each other how you're doing, how you're feeling, whether they see signs and symptoms or not, because a lot of times you won't see it. But if we can just lean on each other and ask how you're doing, and if there's any concerns, then um, find a connection with someone that can help. I agree, doctor. I think uh, we call it, call it check in, check up and uh, check in with with each other you know um with parents when we were going to school and we were practicing my philosophy was i'll have more eyes on your son or daughter who i'm teaching and i'm coaching um more hours out of the day than you will and obviously covid's changed that a little bit now right um but i've always embraced the call call the coach and ask you know you know i've had multiple parents reach out just with a young man who didn't get that scholarship offer that he thought he was going to get and that you know through the communication talking back and forth to this coach it was going to happen um and then just checking in on him you know and and it came from the mom like he would kill me if i if he knew i was telling you this and but it was so helpful for me she was being my eyes and, and for me to communicate to the quarterback's coach or to the linebacker's coach, hey, check in. And then if I have a leader on the team, hey, why don't you check in on this guy? You know, um, we had a player that lost a, uh, lost a father, um, 68 years old, um, and 10 days to this. And, and we, checked in, we checked in and we checked up on each other and, and all the ways that we could. And then on the issues that, that, that we might not know that they're dealing with every single day, but if you get a guy – um, and obviously I'm referring to the young men that I coach, but, um, you know, you, you get one of your teammates to check in and, and that's got to be a daily routine. That's got to be our individual work that turns into our group and teamwork that we would be doing normally on the field, but we got to do it off the field. And I, I think that we have the time and opportunity to do so. And that's what makes it so important. So I agree, Dr. That's dead on. Yeah, those are, those are all great points. And I am so glad that things like this panel are happening because honestly, when you ask that question to the, the doctors at first, I had no clue the answer. I didn't know where to start. So I'm glad things like this are happening that my age group is able to access so that there is information out there and that we're increasing exposure to that information. So like younger athletes have access to get help. Great, great point, Eli. And I was going to suggest as well that sometimes parents have a, or kind of support parents who suspect that there is something, but their, their student athlete is not really going with it or not really sharing. So what I encourage parents in those cases to say, th to, to validate, but not require a, an agreement. So to say things like, you seem, you just really seem disconnected. You seem like you're spending a lot more time in your room. Might not be anything, but it certainly would be understandable because lots of kids your age are having this, are really struggling with missing their seasons and all of that. So I just want you to know, and if you want me off your back, I need to see you connecting with your peers a little more. You know, just kind of gently encourage and you're validating. So maybe if there is something going on, they will share with time as well. Great answers. Our last Q&A from Katie. Uh, Katie was a local regional high school athlete and uh, put off uh, leg surgeries for a number of years. And uh, as her college has given her a gap year. So the uh, inactivity has caused her to ask the question of, you know, what can she be doing at this time during this gap year before she starts participating again to kind of pass the time uh, between no activity and quarantine and COVID. Uh, she's talked about playing instruments, but what are some other ideas that she could be doing or some other coping skills or some things she can do uh, while she's waiting to kind of get up, uh, back on her feet? 
I can jump in real quick. I mean, I think she's already started. Um, so awesome job, Katie, by starting with learning a musical instrument and doing something that you can do um, if you aren't physically able to participate in things. I think this is a thing that comes up often when I um, am working with our student athletes who have um, gone through a season or career ending injury um, here. And so one of the things we always talk about is what are your interests? What other things bring you joy, bring you happiness? Um, can you start trying new things? There are lists everywhere about self-care activities and pleasurable activities um, that you can find. And you know maybe it's things like sitting outside for 30 minutes, just disconnected from all types of technology. Um, maybe it's coloring or journaling or um, watching a funny video on YouTube or making a playlist of music that you really enjoy. It can be a combination really of anything as long as you're doing it. Um, this goes back to mindfulness in a very intentional way that is aimed at um, taking care of yourself and helping yourself to feel better. And I also talk to people about you sort of need a toolbox of those things, right? Like maybe you have one thing um, that works for you when you're sad, but that might not help when you're angry. Um, and so maybe you need to find a separate coping skill that will work for you when you are feeling upset or angry. The same for a lot of different emotions. Maybe it depends on situations. Um, so I would encourage people to really explore different things and, and, COVID has presented that opportunity to maybe try some new things that you wouldn't otherwise have the opportunity to do. And I, and I think that really touches on one of the other silver, silver linings in this situation is that um, people can find out what their true identity is. Oftentimes, you know, young athletes are coming to me and they're playing sports, two, three different teams, seven days a week. They don't have time to do other interests. And it's important for the young athletes to know you're not just a soccer player. You're not just a football player. You're not just a gymnast. You have other skills and other things that you can do. Um, so this, I think, gives them time to really uh, try out different things. Um, and, and especially, you know, nowadays with so many things online, you, you can learn how to play the guitar on YouTube in the comfort of your home. Um, so I, I think the, the sky's the limit for finding new interests. Well, to um, all of our panelists, this, this has gone beyond uh, expected and, and uh, you know, beyond the questions that we had and, and just great dialogue and great starting points for those who are listening and participating with us on how to get that help and, and uh, what are the symptoms and what are the challenges and you know, how do we stay connected and uh, you know, how, how do we stay in that moment with the mindfulness and, and you know, how, how does one bring a team together uh, in Coach Scott's case with 40 or 50 or 60 members uh, in, in a time like this and plan uh, and, and Eli's experience on his team as, as they had the band back together for a spring or possible spring season. Uh, so we uh, appreciate all the uh, responses, all the input, all the expertise here. Uh, uh, Dr. Arcona, we certainly appreciate you and uh, best of luck to you. Uh, Dr. Turk uh, with the Spiders, uh, congratulations to you on, on your new post and uh, best of luck there. Uh, Elliot, uh, you know, as you approach the spring season with some uncertainty uh, there, we, we certainly hope that the team uh, comes back together you guys can kind of get practice and get back in shape, so to speak, and uh, get back on the field in, in the Beach District. Uh, Dr. Brenner, always a pleasure. And I uh, certainly hope to have uh, additional sessions on mindfulness to where we can come back together and talk about performing in that moment and being mentally tough. We, we talk about focus and we talk about uh, being mentally tough, but what does that really mean? So we want to talk about that. And uh, Coach Scott, best of luck with your uh, program. Uh, people just think of players, uh, but it's families, it's administrators, it's the media in Oscar Smith's case and uh, your coaching staff. Uh, so it's more like a college program or even professional in some cases, the, the programs get so large and so much, so many moving pieces to manage. Uh, but we appreciate you all uh, driving force behind this with CHKD Sports Medicine. And they really wanted to uh, delve into uh, the challenges that uh, student athletes and, and their families are facing at this time. And uh, we certainly think we've done that here. Virginia Sports Hall of Fame, again, obviously having uh, access to uh, athletes who have performed at the highest level and really giving back to the community. So, Will, we appreciate what you do there and the uh, Sports Commission and the Hampton Roads Chamber uh, trying to uh, show the impact of sports in our business community and uh, unveil these topics that we'll uh, investigate more. Uh, we certainly appreciate, you know, everyone's participation tonight as we bring it to a close. Uh, we want to acknowledge our gracious sponsors. Uh, once again, uh, Optima Health, uh, Davcon Inc., Atlantic Bay Mortgage, CSKD, Sports Medicine, City of Virginia Beach, and the Hampton Roads Chamber. Uh, we thank all of you who have participated, CHKD, Virginia Sports Hall of Fame, HRSC. You know, we wish you the best and uh, we wish you and your family a uh, safe passage 
as you get back on the fields of play uh, later this fall and early in the spring. We hope that you all be safe and uh, that you would tune into uh, subsequent episodes of uh, the Pandemic Playbook. Uh, we thank all of you and have a good night.